Okay, uh, hello. Uh, today is the 25th of uh, February 2023, and we'll um, start the day talking about a very important Catalan uh, architect, Enric Miralles, 1955-2000. Unfortunately, he died at 45. Um, let's um, let's uh, contemplate a little bit his biography, but before that, Perhaps we should um, uh, contemplate this short phrase, a landscape of intense fragments, which I think um, describes well uh, his architecture, a landscape of intense fragments. Uh, Enric Miralles, um, Enric Miralles Moya, born uh, the 12th of February. Uh, I, I'm sorry, what happened was he was actually born on the 12th of February, <clears throat> but because on the 12th of February, I had um, other four presentations, I chose to postpone the presentation on him for today. Was a Spanish architect from Barcelona. He graduated, well, he could be called also a Catalan architect. Anyway, he graduated from the Barcelona School of Architecture at the Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya in 1978 after establishing his reputation with a number of collaborations with his first wife, Carmen Pinos. The couple separated in 1991. Miraes later married fellow architect Benedetta Taliabue and the two practiced together as EMBT architects an office which still exists and is very successful. Mirai's magnum opus and uh, his lar largest, largest project, the new Scottish Parliament building, was unfinished at the time of his death, but continued the construction under the guidance of his second wife, Benedetta Taliabue. This was the man. And I had the pleasure once to meet him at Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York a few years before he died. Uh, when, when he said that uh, in Spain, uh, there are very few tall buildings. And when I asked him, uh, what about Sagrada Familia? He said, yes, but that's an exception. Well, since he died, other tall buildings uh, popped up in, in Spain. <clears throat> but uh, I think he knew what he was talking about, a very serious and sensitive architect and it's so sad that he died at 45. But he left a very important legacy behind. And today I discovered uh, something very interesting, but, but we'll, we'll, we'll arrive at that particular work uh, very soon. I, I, I kind of rushed this presentation because, as I said, I can only make the presentation for one hour and a half. And we have lots of materials to look at in this very presentation. So this is uh, Enric Miralles, whom I consider one of the best architects of the past 20, 25, 30, 40 years in the world. Some drawings by him. Let's look at some intense fragments. And they are intense, and they are fragments, and sometimes they are beautiful. Uh, he didn't use uh, always so much color, but uh, but uh, his drawings are uh, very exquisite with their, you know, uh, uh, incredible, uh, incredible, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it. it's, it's they are fragments, but they reclaim themselves from, it's not deconstructivism that we are looking at. It's, it's something else. It might appear to be deconstruction, but it's, it's, he differentiates him, himself from the deconstructivist. And I don't know if I am now able to articulate properly the difference between Mirais and uh, the deconstructivist. I have the feeling that he was, his architecture is not, uh, you know, some kind of um, uh, reaction to something. It's, it, it, I think he was still searching for some kind of a center Let's imagine, you know, a pot is broken and the, and the shards could be put together somehow, but he's in the process of contemplating the shards, which were part of a whole pot, but he didn't break the pot. The pot was broken, who knows, by someone else or destiny itself. Uh, 
his manner of building and his manner of conceptualizing architecture was uh, rather unique. But this, this, this drawing, I think, belongs rather to his second wife, Benedetta Taliabue, her new office. First, we start with, his, with the buildings he built together with Carmen Pinos, herself a very established and very important um, a Spanish uh, or Catalan architect. Uh, and uh, as I said, he had two wives, Carmen Pinos and Benedetta Taliabue, and he did remarkable works together with both. Of course, not at the same time. Here they are uh, as uh, young people, perhaps, uh, you know, recent graduates from Barcelona. Uh, Carmen Pinos on the left and on the right, uh, Eric Miralles. Is this school uh, from 1984? Sorry, uh, one is missing there. Uh, we already see, you know, diagonals and diagonals are important in their work, were important in their work and they became, became increasingly important. There are innovations here. Look at those radiators on the right side of the picture or that, uh, you know, uh, sloping uh, surface that leads to the stair. Uh, 1985. Um, here we see again uh, an attempt to uh, escape the, the restrictions of a Cartesian system, and this this will this this tendency increased uh, dramatically even uh, in in later works, and we are going to see that. So there is playfulness. There is uh, an aleatory movement which is not governed by, um, you know, a controlling uh, will or a controlling willful reason. So this, these works that I show now are done in collaboration with Carme Pinos. Carme Pinos, who is a remarkable architect in the present, who continued to, to, to build significantly after he died. Well, after they separated, this is the, I consider them the, the masterpiece, the Igualada Cemetery near Barcelona from 1985 to 1994. Um, it's a very deep and melancholy and poetic meditation on, 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 on the fragility of human existence. I think together with the Brion Cemetery is one of the most remarkable, uh, you know, cemeteries uh, built in modern times. Um, I mean, the plan itself of the cemetery is, is, uh, is remarkable. It's, unfortunately, I should have had this drawing vertically oriented. It's almost like a human silhouette or with a head on the right. And then the you know the the other the the whole body uh, as as it follows uh, a very interesting work. Um, this is actually not the cemetery. This is the cemetery. Uh, and uh, what do we see here? We see this array as probably the 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 event of death provokes in most of us. It is this array. It is disarray, it is melancholia, it is sadness, it is, it is what is supposed to be. And it's done with, with, uh, with uh, architectural means, but architectural means which are not uh, rhetorical or emphatic. They don't try to give us the illusion that everything is fine, that the end of life is just, uh, you know, some kind of Edenic uh, birth into another life. It's, it's, it is, I think, telling the truth about uh, this, uh, this uh, cosmic event that death is, if I am not calling it too emphatically. Igualada Cemetery, Carme Pinos and uh, Eric Miraes. It is really a, an architectonic meditation 
on uh, the shortness of life, on the fragility of human existence, on vulnerability, on um, sadness. I particularly like this view where, you know, with a, with a, I, I would say very inspired, but very modest architectural expression, they show, you know, the, the departure that this means. Igualada Cemetery. Here you see better this, uh, the plan of the cemetery. It's very poetically done, and uh, I mean, this shows great skill. Now, we see here from 1986 to 1992, um, some kind of a, I don't know, part of a civic center, maybe some kind of a, you know, I, perhaps uh, you know, some some kind of hostels, maybe, or some kind of a, he, they he, they did some sportive uh, uh, buildings. I mean, buildings for sports, but I don't know if this is it. This this works could be a little bit, uh, you know, maybe a, li a little bit less poetical if we are to call them so, compared to the Gualada Cemetery, but still. They do have visual interest, and uh, there is a certain sculpturalness which which only evolves in time. As I said, I go a little bit quickly because we have more than 300 pictures to look at. Another a, a school boarding school, 1986 to 1993. I don't find this particularly impressive, but. What is remarkable in his biography is that uh, he was married to two architects, not at the same time, of course, and after his death, they both continued their activity and they, they, they developed further. And uh, this is rather unique as far as I know, where the women architects, when, you know, death takes away their husbands, they they do not succumb to, to to inactivity or sadness or depression, but they take revenge in a way on, on the end of life through increased creativity. And they both did it magnificently, both Carmen Pinos and Benedetta Taliabue, a civic center in Barcelona. Yes, he used a lot, they used a lot of concrete, but we see here already a lot of dynamic qualities, uh, intersections between various diagonals. It's, 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 an, it's an active, uh, dy dynamic architecture. Inventions at the level of, of the column. Uh, a house from 1988 to 1992 in Barcelona. For those who only like rectangular uh, spaces or rectangular rooms, this might come as a surprise, but the, the image of the of the building is towards the outside. It's not so novel. It's not so dramatically fractured from what we call the past. Quite the opposite. I think it 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 it, it gives the illusion that is uh, uh, very similar to the houses around it. Uh, I don't know if at that time that they they used this kind of, uh, of, uh, of rendering. It's possible of, of uh, yeah, rendering, this kind of collage. It's possible that this was done by a student, by some students. Now we arrive at a very dramatic work uh, and even one, one even more dramatic will follow. 
the Olympic ar archery, which was done for the Summer Olympics in 1992. Uh, look at the plan. You wouldn't really, you know, uh, find easily such a structure built for uh, Olympics or for, you know, sports related activities. I find the, the, the plan very beautiful and, and, and inspiring even in terms of graphics. It's a graphic work, but it's actually a, a plan, a plan on which the, the buildings were built. Um, I, here it says that the wrestling rhythmic complexity of the construction drawings for Barcelona's Olympic archery completed in 1991 brought more fame to the 1992 Olympic event than any arrow shot from the building shadow. Uh, the drawings show an overlay of organic curves and re rectilinear shapes working in sublime harmony, producing a composition that clearly conveys both the architect's concept and the process through which it was developed. Amazingly, the project is no less spectacular in person than on paper, and its completion helped launch the husband and wife partnership of Eric Miraes and Carme Pinos into international stardom. Um, I'm not going to read all, all the text. Um, yes, a lot of concrete, and we see here, you know, the drama of uh, bringing into conjunction various construct constructive elements, uh, but it's full of surprises, the building, and uh, this came to, to be the, the trademark of, of their architecture. Uh, they didn't build that uh, boxy uh, building behind. Even more amazing is the pergola they built, and we are going to arrive at it is uh, quick uh, soon. Uh, here are some uh, sections through this uh, archery built for the uh, Barcelona Olympics. And I think this kind of building for a sports activity is um, intensifying the very activity it was built for because it is dynamic and it is uh, stirring up energies. And this is what it's supposed to do. And another sports center, 98-1992, built again with Carmen Pinos. Not too many embellishing things. As you can see, it's raw concrete um, allowed to be as it is without, um, you know, uh, illusionary embellishments. Maybe some people would find this oppressive, maybe. I'm afraid this uh, presentation is a little bit too long, but uh, I prepared it for the last year when I offered this architect uh, the, the immaterial, the other Pritzker Prize, uh, post-mortem, because I think he deserves it. 1990, 90, uh, 91 Center for Rhythmic Gymna Gymnastics, but uh, you'll see, it, it, it didn't, uh, uh, you know, uh, do just uh, buildings for, for sports. It just happened that at, around that time, maybe by the way of the Olympics, they built several buildings, you know, uh, with a destination sport. Now, this pergola I find very dramatic. And uh, today, I found out, and I should have known this before, that actually the avenue on which it is built, 
on which they are built because there are several pergolas, very dramatic, is called uh, Avenue Icaria. And I, I checked, I tried to, under, to translate the, the name, it prob probably has to do with, with Icar, which in Romania or Icarus, you know, the, uh, the fallen uh, um, aspiring uh, being towards uh, approaching the sun and having the wings uh, uh, melt down. And in a way, these dramatic pergolas express broken wings. And I think this might be the explanation. Why would he do such pergolas? They do evoke to me, now that I know the name of the avenue they are on, Icaria Avenue, they do evoke to me what I call broken wings, the wings of Icarus. They are very interesting and very unusual and very even disturbing. I think it is an homage to Icarus or a reference to him. So in this way, it's a narrative architecture. Eric Miraes and Carmen Pinos, Barcelona. Those who only think in uh, placid rectangular ways would be probably disturbed, but uh, that's okay. Now, uh, some projects, this is a bridge. Uh, I just show some, some models from around that time. Um, they didn't build you know, everything they, they projected. I'm talking about the partnership between him and Carmen Pinos. Now we go to the second partnership, Eric Miraes and Benedetta Taliabue. Uh, they, uh, they got married after he separated from Carmen Pinos. Uh, here they are, the younger Benedetta Taliabue, an Italian architect, uh, I think uh, born and uh, raised in Milan. And she found uh, employment in the office of uh, Eric Miraes and Carmen Pinos, and they fell in love, and here they are. 1991 to 2001, uh, this park Santa Rosa in Barcelona, in the province of Barcelona, There is indeed a lot of fragmentation, but a lot of this fragmentation is, I think, indeed uh, intense. A small house, it's actually, a, you'll see, built for children, and uh, it's more like, a, I don't know, some kind of an installation, but I find it very creative and uh, shows the whole philosophy of form, if I am to speak so, of uh, Eric Miraes, and in this case, case Bernadetta Taliabue. You might say formal complications, but I think it's more than just complications. It expresses, I think, the you know, complexity of our time. Uh, that is something else, sorry. Six houses in Amsterdam, very interesting uh, apartment buildings, Amsterdam. Um, here we see some echoes from uh, from um, Alvaralto. Alvaralto did something like this, but inside the building that he built, I think it's, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, uh, this kind of uh, aesthetical approach to housing is innovative and, uh, and um, enjoyable. You know, bringing in color, bringing in ornament, 
bringing in the capriciousness of certain details. Amsterdam. The Netherlands have, of course, their own excellent architects, but when there is excellence outside of the country, they invite that excellence to, to build also uh, there. Now, what do we see here? We see, uh, you know, capricious ornamental interventions, and I think they bring interest to the building. And I think that if this is being done by architects, then there is a need. There isn't a need for uh, you know uh, more or less inspired graffitis because the architects themselves, in the act of you know conceptualizing and projecting and building the building, introduced elements of uh, uh, you know formal rebellion if we are to call ornaments in this way. Park the Diagonal Mar uh, in, in Barcelona. Here again, we, we see, um, you know, this, uh, this uh, turbulent uh, metallic uh, elements uh, dancing and provoking uh, those who are in the proximity to dance themselves or to run on uh, wheels or whatever. We see also here insertions of ceramic work. Let's not forget this is Barcelona, where Antoni Gaudi also used brilliantly a lot of uh, ceramic work. Uh, so maybe there are some oblique or not so oblique references to Antoni Gaudi. Jean Nouvel also built himself, uh, if we are to use the word, uh, to, the verb to build a park in, um, in, in Barcelona. La Clota House, it's, a, it's an interesting house. And I, I like the fact that, you know, there are deviations from um, uh, an il illusory uh, or illusionist uh, completion, that certain parts are left as if uncompleted or incomplete. I think it's OK, because in this way, the final work is also in the process of becoming. So you have being and becoming. It's the, the work is finalized, but it's also open to possible other interventions. It's, it's still in the process of becoming. It's a little house, but uh, look inside. You know, the, I know that Enig Mirais loved books. Uh, his second wife, Benedetta Taliabue, uh, said it uh, several times how much Eric Miraes, he was immensely curious about everything and he was uh, continuously buying books. And uh, I don't know if this is their house or not, but we see that, uh, you know, the library is uh, occupying, uh, you know, a, a central uh, space in the house. Nice, because books bring uh, in not just knowledge, but also worms. And he, he, books connect you on the spiral of time with other beings who also is aspired like you towards knowledge, towards uh, uh, you know wisdom, towards uh, inspiration, and so on. Now today, maybe we don't have so many, so much need any longer for books because we have uh, the internet. But 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 on the other hand, maybe. The books are uh, more sublime even today when, when they are not so needed in as much as the sun, a sunset is more sublime. Exactly when it sets, the sun becomes even more, uh, you know, appealing and, uh, you know, intense, provocative of emotions. Now, this, you are going to see now a most unusual town hall. Well, it's a town hall extension in the Netherlands from 1997 to 2000s. And I don't think you ever saw such a, such a town hall. I mean, look at it. You know, you would say that a town hall is supposed to, you know, a city hall, a town hall, a city hall is supposed to um, induce a feeling of, uh, you know, authority and stability. But here we see, 
the uh, architectonic ex expressions of instability. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it could be uh, puzzling, you know, because you go to the city hall or to the town hall to find authority and, uh, you know, as I say, stability. And instead, what do you see? You see here, it, it, it's almost as if the building is incomplete. It's, it's in the process of becoming. What's going on here? It's, it's, almost, it's almost ruined. But it was conceived in this way, a very unusual way. The frame is sabotaged. The frame of the, of the window is sabotaged. It's broken at the corners and here. Uh, here again. How do you explain this? Uh, the plan, the section, you know, it's a building. It's okay. But uh, if you study it more, you, you realize that there are certain complexities, not to speak about uh, bringing art in this rather dramatic way inside the, the town hall which I think it's a beautiful idea. Why should town halls celebrate only bureaucracy? Why shouldn't they celebrate beauty and art? We are talking about a sophisticated uh, team of architects building for a sophisticated country that accepted such architectonic uh, interventions. Bravo to them, to both. A library, 1997-2001, again, a rather unusual building, a very flat, almost a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, sunken into the ground. Again, we are talking about Eric Miraes and Benedetta Taliabue. We saw at the beginning Carmen Pinos and Eric Miraes. Now we see Benedetta Taliabue and Eric Miraes, the new partnership with his new wife. Now, if you look at this building, would you say it's a library? First, would you say it's a building? But it's both. It's both a building and a library. Eric Miraes and Benedetta Taliabue. Even during construction, I think it is, uh, is rather appetizing, so to speak. Now, this Santa Caterina market in, uh, in Barcelona, a conversion from 1997 to 2001, we remember he died in 2000. So the work was completed by his second wife, Benedetta Taliabue, an image during the construction and the view from the top in a rendering um, or off the top, but now a real view of the building as it was built, the, uh, the roof of the building, which maybe evokes what could be called maybe to an extent, but maybe not because now if we remember the market that uh, MVRDV built in Rotterdam, we could not call with the same assurance this building as the Cathedral of Food, but it has some portions that maybe could evoke some kind of a, you know, monumental building that houses 
food. The plant is, uh, you know, agitated as it is. We already know their manner of, uh, of working and the dynamics of a market are probably adequately expressed. Why should the market be rectangular when the transactions, the negotiations, the testing of the, you know, tasting of the food, the dilemma, what things to buy, all these things that have to do with, you know, uh, myriad of, uh, you know, tendencies and uh, thoughts and feelings and so on, maybe should be expressed in the building itself. So this is the plan of the market. And this is how it looks. Of course, this uh, facade belongs to a previous building. And I think the building around the buildings around the market uh, benefit not just of, of the view that that is, um, you know, uh, facilitated by facing this uh, rather enjoyable roof, but also the proximity to, to this uh, dynamic uh, market which is um, enticing and it's provocative, uh, architecturally speaking. Erin Miraes and Benedetta Taliabue. Barcelona. Santa Caterina the market. I mean, just this part is an architectural event. You know, I mean, if you see it from far away and you don't know what it is, I think normally you are, your curiosity is stirred up. What is this, this architect architectural knot? It, it, it is an architectural event in itself. Not to speak about the drama of the roofing and so on. An extension of a uh, school of music in Hamburg, which now I think uh, has his name, um, or at least a portion of the building after he died. Yes, Mirai's all. So it's 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 uh, you know uh, at least a portion of the building has his name in in his honor in his you know because he died. Now we arrive probably at the most scandalous building that they built because it was a big uh, a big scandal relating to this building. They won the competition and it was built was finalized two years after he died. Uh, and there were uh, great uh, differences in the budget, you know, uh, additional amounts of money, large amounts of money had to be added in order to complete this most unusual parliament building in Edinburgh, Scotland, 1998-2002. We remember he died in the year 2000. Now, is there another parliament building like this one in the world? I don't think it is. You know, it's, again, it's maybe sabotaging authority understood in its classical way of manifesting itself. Uh, it's, 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 it's in a way an invitation to the common man, you know, the person on the street to step in the building without being afraid of being crushed by a, you know, stern authority. What do you think these are? These kind of bow windows, if we are to call them so, they are alcoves for the members of the parliament, and we are going to see images from the inside. These are, these are very unusual.
that this is this is what happens inside and you can only imagine a member of the parliament sitting there near the window and having uh, you know files and folders on those shelves and uh, you know doing his job in a rather unusual and maybe even romantic uh, uh, manner even playful perhaps so a most unusual uh, uh, office for uh, members of the Scottish Parliament and the great, uh, you know, meeting uh, hall, uh, you know, the great uh, uh, chamber, if we are to call it so, where decisions, important political decisions uh, had to be made and have to be made. The building belongs to the present. So again, it's possible with creativity to uh, assert an unusual architecture, even for uh, complicated programs, political programs like uh, the building of a parliament. Eric Miraes and Benedetta Taliabue, the prime minister here of uh, Scotland and the uh, uh, queen of England of Great Britain, Yes, it takes courage to do something like this. But courage sometimes is uh, received favorably by fate. A museum, but no, uh, no picture, sorry. Uh, now this is a corporate building. Uh, it's not one of my favorite buildings by them, but has an unusual part to it. It's for gas, of course, uh, you know, a uh, gas company in Barcelona, a lot of glass. Of course, it's a corporate building. But what is intriguing is this part of the building, which I don't know. I didn't study the plan uh, to see what's going on here. But it's, it's, um, it's maybe, uh, you know, an architectonic expression of some, something subversive from the side of architects. This is what I'm... Uh, Tempty to think and feel. And look at the plan. Unusual, no? Eric Miraes and Benedetta Taliabue. Even with glass, even working for a, you know, a gas company, you can still create architecture and create intriguing things if, if you have the <clears throat> reputation to allow uh, you to uh, act in this way. If you don't, it's more uh, difficult. <clears throat> Otherwise, the building as a whole is not so surprising. You know, doesn't matter that, uh, you know, approximately audacious uh, cantilever part. Too much glass for my taste, but maybe for a gas company is the correct choice, maybe. Uh, what is this in Hamburg, uh, some kind of a park or, you know, playing area in a park. We saw something similar in, in Barcelona. Maybe more vegetation was needed here and is needed here. Looking back, I still find that the work uh, done, uh, the Igualada Cemetery is probably the best work done by Enrique Miraes when he worked together with Carmen Pino. Some other projects, I'm not going, I, I just show a few words about them. They did a lot of works because they were very successful. A new building of the architecture faculty in Venice, Italy, a project 2000-2005. Um, the acceptance of the discipline of the existing, a ghost that is present during the whole changing process of a building as a physical quality of time embodied in, in things. The model, it was not built, but maybe it would have been nice if it was built, the plan and the unusual way of, uh, you know, of... Uh, rotating the facades of the building, but, but actually it works very well because you can understand very well the relationship between the, the elevation, the facade, and the particular side of the, of the plan that it refers to. 
He obviously, Eric Miraes uh, and uh, Bernadette Ataliabue and Carmen Pinos love diagonals, as you can see. So a new building for Venice, but it was not built. Folding, zigzagging seems to give the building a maze quality, increasing the depth in space that has its consequence in time. Now it seems that time capturing time has substituted space. Buildings want to capture time, especially in Venice, to enter time, to be at the right time. Some furniture, and with this we end this rather uh, rushed uh, presentation of uh, Eric Miraes. Uh, the Sentada chair for Art España. It's a chair. Another one which uh, reminds it reminds one a little bit, uh, both a little bit of Alvar Alto and Frank Gehry. Yet it's a it's a designed by uh, Eric Miraes. A table. But uh, most unusual table, it's more like a sculpture, which which is uh, which allows for uh, several kinds of arrangements, folding and unfolding, and you know moving certain parts in a certain way. I find it very interesting. Uh, here again, it's about uh, the dynamic qualities of of an object, and yes, in that sense. The manipulation of the parts of this object also implies, in a certain way, time. So it can be like this, but it also can be like this, and like this, and like this, and maybe in some other ways. Nice. And it almost becomes an organism. Why not? And some drawing, some sketches for the building, for the for the furniture, for the table. Here we see actually Benedetta Taliabue, this table installation, or call it as you wish, found the room also in their office in Barcelona. Other furnitures. Eric Miraes. Okay, that's it. And uh, because I said uh, I will also talk about uh, something else, I will talk about uh, Mark Rothko because on this day, the great North American painter um, uh, died, but not in this year. I mean, not in the same year as, uh, you know, it's not about that. The year is about uh, the day. So let's talk a little bit of, of uh, or maybe, yeah, I'll talk about Mark Rothko too now. We begin, uh, uh, of course, uh, a presentation of Mark Rothko deserves much more time than I have now at my disposal. But because um, he's connected with this day, the 25th of February, I thought of paying homage to him by showing the Rothko Chapel and a few of his paintings. He was born in uh, Lithuania, I think in 1903 and died in 1970 when he committed suicide. Uh, you see, he died on February 25th, 1970, so 52, 53 years ago. Mark Rothko, born Markus Jakovlevich Rothkovic, um, was born in uh, 1903, but died February 25th, 1970 was a Latvian, Latvian, sorry, not Lithuania, was a Latvian American abstract painter. He is best known for his color field paintings that depicted irregular and painterly rectangular regions of color, which he produced from 1949 to 1970. He was one of the great uh, uh, North American painters together with Jackson Pollock, an abstract expressionist, very different from uh, you know the action painting of Jackson Pollock. We are going to see some of his works. Although Rothko did not personally personally subscribe to any one school, he's associated with the American abstract expressionist movement of modern art. 
originally emigrating to Portland, Oregon from Russia with his family, Rothko later moved to New York City where his youthful period of artistic production dealt primarily with urban scenery. In response to World War II, Rothko's art entered the transitional phase during the 1940s where he experimented with mythological themes and surrealist to express tragedy. Towards the end of the decade, Rothko painted canvases with regions of pure color, which he further abstracted into rectangular color forms, the idiom he would use for the rest of his life. Um, don't know what's going on. Uh, he, ah, yes, there is another line which is hidden by this uh, tab. In his later career, uh, Rothko executed several canvases for three different mural projects. The Sigra murals were for the uh, uh, restaurant Four Seasons in the building by Miss van der Rohe. The Sigra murals were to have decorated the Four Seasons restaurant in the Sigra building, but Rothko eventually grew disgusted with the idea that his paintings would be decorative objects for wealthy diners and refunded the lucrative commission, donating the paintings to museums, including the Tate Modern in London. The Harvard mural series was gifted to a dining room in Harvard's Holyoke Center. Uh, their colors faded badly over time due to Rothko's use of the pigment lethal red together with the regular sunlight exposure. The Harvard series has since been restored using a special lighting technique. Rothko contributed 14 canvases to a permanent installation at the Rothko Chapel, which we are going to see a non-denominational chapel in Houston, Texas. Um, again, uh, one of the truly important uh, painters of, uh, of, uh, of the United States. Here he was, uh, and um, as I said, he, he died at, uh, I think, uh, 66, he committed suicide when he had immense success, which shows that immense success doesn't make one happier. After all, Marilyn Monroe died like this, Michael Jackson died like this, and Elvis Presley died like this. And they were immensely successful, if by, if by success we mean the adulation of a large number of people, the adulation of uh, money, the adulation of everything. And yet they all died tragically, and so did Mark Rothko. He was a great painter. I mean, these canvases so have so much depth that they, they are not, they are not, they are not decorative at all. You know that there is depth in these paintings. Uh, you know, you might see just, uh, you know, you would say there are just three colors. No, there is much more to it. The mystical paintings, actually, and the Rothko Chapel, which I wanted to show, by the way, of architecture, and by the way that he died on the 25th of uh, February. Here uh, there are a few words about it. The Rothko Chapel is a non-denominational -den chapel in Houston, Texas, founded by John and Dominique de Menil. The interior serves not only as a chapel, but also as a major work of modern art. On its walls are 14 paintings by Mark Rothko in various hues of black. The shape of the building, an octagon inscribed in a Greek cross, and the design of the chapel were largely influenced by the artist, meaning Mark Rothko. The chapel sits two miles southwest of downtown uh, in the Monroe's neighborhood, situated between the building housing the, housing the Menil collection and the chapel of St. Basil in the campus of the University of St. Thomas. About 110,000 people visit the chapel each year. Uh, this person, Susan Barnes states, the Rothko Chapel became the world's first broadly ecumenical center, a holy place open to all religions and belonging to none. 
it became a center for international, cultural, religious, and philosophical exchanges for colloquia and per per performances. And it became a place of pri private prayer for individuals of all faiths. On September 16, 2000, the Rothko Chapel was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. This is the building from the outside. And as we read, Mark Rothko had an important role in uh, you know, designing, conceptualizing the building, although he was held by three architects, one of them being Philip Johnson, the first architect he worked with, worked with and then, you know, something happened and uh, Philip Johnson left and then Mark Rothko worked with two other architects. Uh, this is the so-called the, the conceptual uh, uh, plan of the chapel, the octagon with the, you know, the positioning of the panels uh, within, the, <clears throat> within the chapel. But uh, what is strange is that some people I read and I was rather amused, uh, you know, they entered the chapel and they asked the question, where are the paintings? Because, because they don't expect to just see, you know, uh, 14 uh, large uh, paintings, uh, um, roughly just black paintings, uh, and they don't look like their expectation of paintings. So they enter the chapel and they ask, where are the paintings? Now here we see also the landscape. Here is the broken obelisk um, uh, sculpture, which he didn't do, uh, was uh, donated by uh, uh, Neumann, I think the name of the artist, the sculptor. And this is the, you know, the, the axonometric view of the octagon, uh, that uh, houses uh, this chapel. And I took these images from March Daily, which had an extensive uh, presentation of, uh, of this chapel, you know, uh, housing uh, 14 paintings by a major painter, but also a building <clears throat> where, uh, where the, the artist had something to say like an architect, because he, he conceived this uh, house for his own paintings. And some images from the interior. Mark Rothko. So it is a non-denominational chapel, meaning it's a chapel which does not address a specific religion, although I understood at the beginning it was meant to serve a Roman Catholic uh, religion, the Roman Catholic religion, but in time it became a non-denominational. It's very simple, but the, the symbolism of, Tagon, of the octagon is not so simple. Here is the painter in his uh, studio. I understood he smoked incessantly. A very intense man. And you have to be intense in order to, to, to arrive at the achievement he arrived. Again, the, the sculpture, sculpture is not by him. But the sculpture, I think, is well chosen and it, it, it is evocative in a way of the meaning of the paintings inside the chapel. From what I read, it's a mystical experience to be inside the space of the chapel and to contemplate these paintings, which are not just, you know, that he covered the canvases with black and that was it. No, it, it first it's not, uh, it's not just blackness and it's not, uh, it, it's, 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 it's mystery there, it's depth in these paintings which appear at the first size to be black. But you see there are small differences that are actually born from the inner tension of the artist.
I wouldn't say it's a chapel that, um, you know, uh, consoles you, that, uh, you know, soothes you. No, it's, it's a chapel that, uh, that uh, makes you think and uh, perhaps uh, makes you uh, arrive at a certain uh, pessimism, perhaps. But maybe I'm wrong about this, because good art probably transcends transcends um, in the end pessimism, maybe even the disasters of war of Goya and uh, uh, you know the Pituras Negras of Goya, who also painted with black, but uh, here the blackness is rather you know uh, overwhelming. I wonder what the Texans with their, you know, the cowboy cowboy hats feel in this uh, abstract environment. The Rothko Chapel, Texas, Mark Rothko. There was another painter, and probably there are many other painters, but there was another famous French painter, Pierre Soulage, the, the king of black, uh, who died, uh, you know, some months ago at the age of, uh, I think, 102 or 101. Uh, but uh, a different painter, although he's known as either the prince or the king of black, um, very different from Mark Rothko. So, you know, usually you, you, start, you start with the building and then you feel the building, if it is a museum or a gallery or, you know, something destined for art, with art. But here, actually, the work began with the paintings. You know, the painter contemplated the building to be built around the paintings and for the paintings. There were some studies of light. I have, I, I end this very short presentation of Mark Rothko with uh, two or three images. Uh, I don't know how they were done. I imagine, um, you know, with, using some digital techniques, studies of light within the chapel. That's it.